Welcome to Fan Arcade with Revit, the show made for emerging music artists. Join us as we chat with music's finest, sharing expert insights and personal journeys for growing your fan base and building stronger connections with your supporters. If you're an emerging artist, stay tuned. Welcome, everybody. We're here today with Josh Kaplan, talent manager, manager of Doja Cat, Cool Kids, Sir Mike, Alex Bannon, many more. He's managed a ton of producers, co-founder of Songfinch, where they're helping independent artists monetize their work, which is very aligned with Rivet. And he has an extensive background in music law, founder of the Kaplan Law Firm, founder of Good Day Management, lawyers for musicians, and so much more. Please welcome Josh to the Fanarchy with Rivet show. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing good. That was a great intro. That sounded very impressive on, uh, on paper. <laughs> How's the day going? Uh, it's gloomy, but it's all right. Happy to happy to be in an indoor space right now. It's not gloomy for us. We're so happy to have you. Oh, thanks. Man. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get right into it. We want to know a lot more about your story with talent management and how you got into it to start. All right. Um, like you mentioned, I was I was a, a lawyer first. Um, started at a firm. Uh, and like you hear these stories, like you're going to be, uh, you know, a first year associate and you're going to just be swamped with work and never see the light of the day. And, uh, I had kind of the opposite experience. I was in a, a windowless office and I feel, feel like people forgot about me. Uh, and so I didn't have anything to do. Like literally I had, I played basketball at lunch for like an hour and a half and like nothing to do. And then one attorney started giving me work and he was like in, um, airplane law. And I was like, I'm never going to be an airplane lawyer, you know? And so I started getting my own clients. And what is airplane law? I mean, it's like accidents, you know, like Plane crashes. Ac- oh, wow. Yeah, and like horrible stuff. Yeah. Can I swear on here? Yeah. Okay, I can't help that. So <laughs> sometimes I swear. Uh, yeah, like just awful things. And like from small aircraft to like, you know, United Airlines crashing and stuff. And I had no interest, no background in that and saw that like there was no future in that for me. And so I knew a bunch of creative people. Um, I got introduced to a bunch of like jewelry designers and DJs and artists and, and they all needed help. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was like, well, I I am a lawyer. I can start helping. And I didn't have to charge them that much. And so I started getting clients that way. Um, and then I got introduced to the cool kids right as they were about to take off. Like they just started to take off. Um, I still didn't really know what I was doing. But there, it wasn't that hard to figure out, right? Like I was starting to get trained as a corporate lawyer. I switched law firms and I got a, a good background in like corporate law and a little bit in intellectual property law, like copyrights, publishing, that kind of stuff. And the cool kids kind of fell into my lap and I started working with them and I just figured it out. And that's when I started realizing how the industry is completely screwed if you're a, a, a musician. Um, and how musicians just were not protected at all. So I started the Lawyer for Musicians blog at that time, Um, and I got asked to manage the cool kids, but I had like a mountain of legal debt, you know, law school debt, and uh, I just couldn't do it at that time, but I was like, oh, yeah, there's probably something there in the management side. It kind of always stuck with me. Um, And then the guys who introduced me to the cool kids, if you fast forward – they wound up producing a bunch of stuff for Lady Gaga. And when they started taking off, it was three guys. When they started taking off, I was doing everything. I was doing the legal and I was doing management. And I started what was called Propeller Music back then. And that was my management company to manage them, essentially. And then at that time, the cool kids had kind of taken a hiatus. And I brought on a couple of other smaller bands and independent uh, musicians, but it was really focusing on the producers, and I kept my law firm, and that was the time when I started my own firm. Um, and so it was really doing both at the same time, but I hated being a lawyer, <laughs> um, and just it, it, primarily dealing with other lawyers was the worst part of it, um, and just kept butting heads with all these people who couldn't believe that there was a music lawyer in Chicago and not in New York or L.A., um, and so I got a pretty big chip on my shoulder uh, and just saw like, I, I just, I don't want to keep doing this. I don't want to keep being a lawyer and deal with more lawyers. Um, so, uh, yeah. So the management just kept going kept going. And then about 2015, 16, 
um, it took off more because of my relationship with Doja. Um, and it took a while, but at the end of last year, I officially sort of retired as being a lawyer because for a long time I was both her lawyer and her manager, and that's not a great situation to be in. Um, Why is that? Uh, there's a there's can be a conflict, you know, if you're not ethical um, and you don't have certain measures in place. When you get an artist that is as big as she is, everybody's looking to poke holes and try to swoop in and take over. And so it just it, it just wasn't necessary. I was having my associate at the time handle most of the work anyway, um, and I was looking for a way out of of being a lawyer and there was so much work as management um that it just made made sense to to get out and so that's a very condensed version of how it wanted yeah. but the legal background obviously it helped me i understood what all the contracts meant i understood what all the rights were on both sides of you know um from the 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 label side versus the artist side and the corporate background helped me build out businesses for artists as well and um and yeah and so because of Doja's rise and the amount of, you know, fame and money that she makes, it allowed me to just focus on that. And that's, we skipped over Song Finch, but that, that was happening <laughs> during that time as well. Um, oh, good things. <laughs> yeah, the really good things. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it, it wound up. It was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a weird, I didn't go to law school thinking, oh, I'm going to be a music manager, you know, and I do remember meeting some, lawyers who were managers and I'm like, Oh man, they, they kind of figured it out. Um, and you know, it's like anything like grass is always greener, but for me, like on the legal side, the grass was not green <laughs> and, and I just like, it's just so much stress and it's so much just bullshit you have to deal with. And it really is like 99% just having to deal with other lawyers. It's not the work, like the work itself is fine. You know, the contracts are fine, all that kind of stuff. I also saw that like, most of the stuff we were doing as lawyers are going to, it's going to be replaced by AI. Like for real, that, that is happening. Um, and I just, yeah, I just wanted to get out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. That, so that's, that's, that's how I am where I am now. I Congrats guess. on retirement. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> semi retirement. Yeah. Semi, I feel like I'm busier now, but it's more enjoyable. And with your like artists, it seems like there is some relationship community between them. Like how did that kind of come about over time? Um, well, I mean, there isn't with, with Doja. She's sort of in yeah. this other atmosphere. Um, it was a lot of Chicago stuff. Um, you know, I, and I, I work with artists that I actually like and enjoy being with, um, and they're all really good people. Um, and so I want them to work with other good people, you know? And so, like, someone like Jude Schuma, who is, like, a funk... Uh, it's like a cross between Beastie Boys and or no Nirvana and Beach Boys and like he's he's one of my favorites but I had him working with cool kids and and like it worked you know somehow just like getting like-minded good people together work Alex Bannon has worked with Chuck from the Cool Kids um I've got uh this uh woman Ava and she's working with Mark Nyland who's a producer it's just they all it's like if you have good people together you want them to work together yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. That's super cool. What is, for you, your experience now, having done this for a while, what is your understanding of what a good talent manager looks like? And how do you know a talent manager is doing their job well? That's a great question. I think um, I think you have to really care. I've seen, even just with the experience with Doja, like we've gone through several iterations of management. There's the, It started out, where her last man, when I got brought back in, um, her last manager quit, just was like, uh, she's not going to do anything, quit. Um, and it was me and the, this guy Yeti Beats who had discovered her. Um, and this other woman, um, Lydia, who was, uh, I forgot, she was an intern at a label. There was, I don't remember the origin story of her, but, um, it was clear we needed somebody a little more connected in LA, right? And I'm here in Chicago. The other two people were not really managers, right? Like they were trying to figure it out. Um, but yet he's a producer and he's a talent, you know, and Lydia was pretty new at that time. Um, and so we partnered with Sal and Co um, because we needed that influence. She was on the cusp of getting big and I could only do so much 
politics here, you know, um, and it wasn't really, I didn't have the experience. I had experience with top, you know, Grammy winning producers, but not talent. It's different, right? So we partnered with him. And the best thing that came out of that relationship was uh, my partner now, Gordon Dillard, who was a day-to-day manager for Sal and Co. And it was really clear very quickly that he and I were doing the bulk of the work. And he and I see we are we couldn't be more different in terms of what we look like and our upbringing and all that. But like we both he doesn't have a mustache. He do, well, <laughs> no, no he, he couldn't grow one like me. But uh, <laughs> but he and I like it's you have to work really hard. You have to be uh, smart and you have to be able to communicate clearly. And you also have to put the artist first. That That is something that I saw over and over um, is that it's this weird thing where managers want the spotlight and instead of shining the spotlight on the artist and you have to listen to the artist. I think one of the most unique skills I have as a manager is that I'm a parent and it really is like so much of being a parent is like, all right, your kids are going to have a temper tantrum. They're going to freak out at a restaurant. It's not the end of the world. Like you just kind of have to be even keel. And yeah. Let let them do that. Yeah, just throw them away. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and just realize, all right, like the, their kids, this is going to happen. And not that artists are, you know, like a six year old child, but sometimes they are, and sometimes they just need to let it out and be creative and be whatever they need to be. And it's not the end of the world. And as long as the music is good and you do what you're supposed to do, like it's going to be fine. Yeah. It really is. And so. I think that is what is key. It's like you can't freak out over every bad thing. You can't get too excited when good things happen. You just have to kind of keep your eye on the prize. And I think combination, I can only speak for myself, but a combination of, you know, having the corporate background, knowing how to build businesses and being a parent, I think like that's the, I don't know, that, that's what I guess makes me a decent manager. At yeah. This point. One thing you said there just made me have a side question about, what it's like for you when you manage higher profile people and you just like wake up in the morning, something's trending and you don't even know oh, what is that like? That's like every week. Um, <laughs> there's there, I can tell you one story, uh, where, uh, we had to do a song for Taco Bell. Uh, I, we didn't Doja had to do a song for Taco Bell as part of her big campaign like, are you doing ad libs. Like, no, no I, I didn't. I, I produced the track. No, I, it was, um, it was this whole campaign where she brought back the Mexican pizza. Right. And it was the most successful campaign, uh, Taco Bell's had. Like, I don't know. They sold out of Mexican pizzas the day that it was announced. Right. But part of the contract that she had to fulfill was to create a song um, in a like TikTok format, right? I remember this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Doja doesn't do well being told to do things, right? And the reason why that campaign worked so well is she was she's the anti anti hero, right? Like yeah. she ripped on Taco Bell, yeah. you know, and it worked great. And at a certain point, she maybe went a little too far, but. Whatever, she had to turn this song in by the next day. We were getting hit up by Taco Bell and the agency like crazy, and they're freaking out. They're like, we have to get this song. We have to get this song. And so we were talking to her, like, you got to do this. She didn't want to do it. And then I get a notification that she's on IG Live, and that always makes my heart (laughs) flutter. And I think it was like midnight here in Chicago, and my partner Gordon's texting me, and he's kind of like, oh, shit. You know, she's making the song and she had to have the song be approved first, right? Like you can't just turn it in. She started using samples. She was using a SpongeBob sample. We're like getting told to pull the electricity on her house. They're (laughs) freaking out. I'm in bed. My wife is like, what is going on? And, you know, so I'm calling her. I had to call her and Gordon had to call her while she's on live, And so she goes on mute. She's like, hold on, goes on mute. And we're like, hey, you know, like, how's it going? Maybe you want to stop doing this right now. And she didn't want to stop. And what she did wound up being iconic. It was this like amazing song about the Mexican pizza. And it just won an award like at at the um, what a Clio or something like that. Just won something big. But like, yeah, I, I think. Back to your original question, like, how do you feel when these things just start trending and that stuff? It's fine. Like, it's fine. It's really not the end of the world. It's like, 
if there's a slow news day, it might stick around for a couple days or something like that. But then it always just goes back to the music. And like, if music's good, people forget about a lot of that stuff. I always say like, I just have a really weird job, you know, and most of the time it's totally fine. And then there's moments of like intense stress. But like I said before, like, I just don't get too high or too low. It's just like, all right, well, she's on live and like, this probably isn't going to go well, but nobody's going to die. You know, nobody's going to get hurt. You know, we're not saving the world. It's just music. It's like, um, yeah. So you just kind of have to be an adult about it and just kind of roll with it, I would say. Yeah. And then, you know, there's damage control. There's like, you know, we've had some incidents with her that have gotten serious and, um, you know, there's always an explanation for it. And like, I remember having to deal with crisis PR, which is in my opinion, a waste of money. Um, but yeah, I mean, people freak out and then there's really not a reason to, yeah. you know, um, the whole cancel culture thing has come up so many different times. You know, I think there's a, a culture to cancel, cancel culture now. So <laughs> I don't know. Where do you stand? I, I think it's ridiculous. I think that if someone does something horrible, if you're Harvey Weinstein, like, yeah, you should be canceled. You should go to jail, you know. But um, these artists are just under such scrutiny. And, you know, we were talking about before, like, fans feel like they have this personal connection because music is so personal. People hear music and they, you know, it's like what you guys are doing, what Songfinch is doing. You hear a song and it's about you, whether it was written for you or not, you feel like it's about you. So then you think that this artist is talking to you and fans get this crazy connection and think that they know these artists and they, they don't at all. They know the, the songs and they know the, you know, outward persona and it could be a total act, you know, yeah. like Taylor Swift could be a horrible person. She's not, but like she could be <laughs> like this awful person behind closed doors but she's this angel on stage and so people are like oh my god she's she's the best and like she could be like kicking puppies i don't know you know like there could be horrible <laughs> things so it, i think it's i think the internet has made it so that people just assume a they can say whatever they want because it's anonymous and b they know everything there is to know about any celebrity and it's just it's bullshit yeah i agree yeah on um, the you also mentioned something that's a later question i had but i think i can ask now is like that difference between the producer management and the yeah. artist management. What is that for you? Yeah, I mean, that it is. It's a very different skill set for producers. You know, you're looking to place their music and to get them in the studio with people nonstop, right? And it, it you have to work with publishers. You have to work with labels. The perfect scenario for a producer is to get in with an artist, right? Like the guys that I was work that I had been working with they had this relationship with Gaga and she just like, we're like, okay, this is my crew. This is who I'm going to work with. Bruno Mars has that with his crew. And like Doja had it uh, for a long, for her first three albums with Yeti. Like he did everything, you know, he brought other people in. Um, but that's a dream scenario for a producer. If you're a, just a producer trying to get a hit, like you, is that the same thing with like Macklemore, or Ryan Lewis? That yeah, thing? yeah. 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 And you know, it's like, um, you know, Rick Rubin is this like executive producer. He comes in and sprinkles his magic, but he's not making the music. Yeah. You know, the guys that are making the music, trying to get in those rooms is really, really hard. There are so many producers. Um, and, you know, it, people submit beats and pray, you know, yeah. and like I get hit up every day with beat packs. Like, hey, get this to Doja, get this. I, I don't think I've ever sent one through. Oh, really? Yeah. Sorry to crush <laughs> people's dreams, but like, you know, it she has to be asking for something like, you know, and, and if you're randomly hitting me on my DM, like, I'm not, I'm not gonna probably listen, yeah. you know, I'm not actively looking. She's not always making music. And when she is, we're going to go to people that we trust and that we know. And like for this new album that she's got, we did, we asked for beats. Like we, she had a very specific sound that she wanted and we worked with certain people and then, and then we needed more. So like we went to people that we knew and, and got them and that's what a publisher is supposed to do and what a manager of a producer is supposed to do. So for me, like managing the guys that I was managing, they had this relationship with Gaga. So it was really managing that relationship with her team and making sure that we were getting paid when we were supposed to get paid and getting credit and figuring out where they needed to be when she was, you know, touring and all that kind of stuff. And then looking for other opportunities and some producers get this big 
persona, right? Where they can go out and DJ and they can, you know, I mean, look at Metro Boomin, yeah, right? Like albums. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, you know, that, that can be a goal. It depends on who the producer is. Um, and that's more of a grind. That's more of like, you got to just be hustling, trying to get beats to the right people and figuring out who's, who's looking, you know, like that's what everybody's trying to do. And that's what publishers are supposed to do. Yeah. Um, but they don't always, unless you're super hot, you know, they're not going to always look for a, a producer that hasn't had a number one hit, you know? So it's totally different on, on a, on a talent, you know, musician side, feature artist side. Um, there's so much more, you know, when you're dealing with someone like at Doja's level, she's about to go on tour. You know, when we go on tour, there's going to be a staff of 75, hundred people. Like we have to make sure all those people are good. We have to hire the tour manager. We have to hire the audio team, the production team, the choreographer, the dancer. It's, it's running a business, you know, she's not picking them. She trusts us to pick the right people and like we have our core team, but then to expand that out and make sure everybody's paying the right amount or getting paid the right amount, that's that's a lot. Then you've got an album, you know, you've got to figure out what songs are going on in the album, what the sequence is. You still got to talk to radio people. You got to kiss the right ass, make sure the song's getting premiered. You got to work on music videos. You got to work on merch. There's it's it's nonstop. I understand she's at a very elevated position right like this, she's in the one percent of artists but on a lower level it's the same thing the hardest part at the lower level is you got to find money right we're in a fortunate position where the label pays for a lot you know um and we can find sponsors and people are trying to get in business with us you know until she goes on the internet again but that's a separate, <laughs> that's a separate story but no for real i mean like that it's it's um it's a very fortunate position to be in and it's what every independent musician is i think what most independent musicians are striving toward right like trying to get to that level where they can just see their vision on a much bigger level yeah absolutely with rivet you can put your fan engagement on autopilot deepen your fan relationships and take your sales all the way up join our exclusive beta today at rivet.app for free if someone wants to get into music management, what should they do? Um, man, I get asked that a lot. Um, you know, I I think um, there's a bunch of different entry points. Um, it's really having a relationship with an artist. You know, a lot of times artists start and their manager is who's ever their like best friend, uh -huh. right? And like yeah. who's in the scene or whatever. And, excuse me. That that's how it it was with. Um, the cool kids, you know, one of their like buddies who was really creative started out as a manager and like, it was pretty quickly thereafter where things got so big that he needed some help. Um, I think, you know, like there's the intern route, right? You go work for a scooter Braun or one of those, you know, a rock nation or something like that. It sounds horrible to me. Um, but that's one way there's no easy way in. I think that like some of the younger managers that I've seen that are good, they just, yeah, they like developed a relationship with an artist who they really liked. I knew a guy that he really loved this one artist. He went to all of her shows and just talked to her. It's like, Hey, I think I can help you, you know, um, be organized, be like, you know, efficient and be tenacious. Like until you get to the point where you're, you're trying to get, it's really hard to sell yourself as an experienced manager to somebody who is already a major artist, right? Like you kind of have to start at the same spot as an artist, mm. right? You know, like a kid out of college isn't going to be able to go to Rihanna and be like, Hey, I should be your manager. Yeah. So you've got to have some common sense. And that, that is another theme that <laughs> I want to bring up. Like people say common sense is not common, especially in the music industry. And like, I don't want to sound pompous or anything, but like, I think, having common sense and like just knowing right from wrong will get you a long way in, in, in music, especially because you have a lot of people who are like, they're in it for the wrong reason. They're trying to be in it because they want to be on tour and they want that life. And it's just, it's just not about that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. All through your career in the music business, you've been a champion of independent artists and what does that mean to you and why are you so much of an advocate for them? Yeah. Cause I, I I've seen it. I've been fortunate to see it on both sides. Right. And it's like, I fought in my early career to get 
some clients out of horrible deals and saw how they were just getting completely screwed over by labels or even if they were independent labels, just getting fucked, you know, like <laughs> because they didn't know better or because they had bad advice or something like that. So it, or it just, some things you saw. I, I mean, just contracts that like were perpetual, right? Like they, there's no out. And like, even if you are making your publisher or your label money, they're not counting that money toward your recoupment. Like just crazy stuff to trap artists in. I've seen artists get shelved so they have no way out. I'm dealing with a situation right now with, with a client where they have a great offer on the table, but they're not letting them do anything solo, even though their solo music doesn't sound anything like the band. Mm. It, it's just like this antiquated entrapment sort of um, vibe that is it's crazy that it's still happening. It's gotten better, but it's still happening. But but for me, it was like, and especially with Songfinch, seeing these artists who were crazy talented, but they're having to work 20 different jobs or whatever it is and not work on what they want to do, I think that would be just crushing. Like, you're really good. You know you're good. You just can't figure out the audience or whatever it is. You should still be able to make money, right? You know? And so Songfinch is sort of the culmination of all of that. And that's what I'm so proud of. It's like, we've been we've paid millions and millions of dollars to artists that nobody's ever heard of. We're paying artists more than most independent labels are paying by far. Like it's not even a comparison. So I, I think it's just like, I, I'm a champion of talent and if like people can write songs and affect people and, you know, but they can't quite figure out how to get it on billboard charts, you know, doesn't mean they're not good. doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to do that for a living. So yeah, and it's really complicated. Like the laws for the music industry were set up to confuse <laughs> artists, like for real, you know? There's still like mechanical royalty rates are just it doesn't make any sense. And yeah, I don't know. So I just I, I guess I just have it in me to like want to write that wrong. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And uh you also talk a lot about creating actionable partnerships that balance out both sides between artists and brands that they partner with in terms of just putting them in better positions like that. And I wanted to talk to you about a little bit more about the significance of that and why you think that way. Um like brand, you mean like just uh aligning a brand with yeah. an artist? Well, I mean I think, you know, for a long time it was like selling out, right? To to partner with a brand and then that completely flipped and it's like if you don't have brands you're not making money you know you can be an artist that is top 20 on spotify but you're not making money from your music because your deal is crappy mm -hmm. and your royalty rate is bad and they're counting every single dollar against recoupment and you you're not gonna you're just not gonna make even if you're making millions on streams you're still not going to make money because you you spent a million on your video or whatever it is, yeah. you know? So it's like, it's stacked up against you unless your deal is, is correct. So brands are essential. Like if you don't have brands, you, it's really hard to make money for a long time for, for Doja in particular, for early part of her career, the only way that we really brought money in was from brand deals. Um, it has to be the right partnership. They have to understand the artist. Um, we have a guy that works with us now, Nick Pacelli, who's amazing. He speaks brand, right? Like he knows how to sort of set the table and explain, okay, well, this is what you can expect from the artist and here's what we're expecting from you. And it's a, it, it has to be a good partnership. You know, for a lot of artists, you'll see a lot of product placement in videos. You know, that's one way to offset payment. That's not really a partnership. It's just a check, you know, yeah. or like an Instagram post. That's not a partnership, but you know, it's just a way to make money. Um, but a partnership needs to work. Like Taco Bell worked really well for Doja. She loves Taco Bell. Yeah. You know, and like they, still. yeah, she, yeah, still, <laughs> I think, you know, no, no, for real. She does. <laughs> but like the, the, they were cool with just being like, all right, let's do something out of the box. Let's be different. And let's, you know, let's go with this idea of an anti-hero. you know, like we have a partnership with Skechers. Like you wouldn't really identify Skechers and Doja Cat, but they've they're like, cool. Let's do it. Like let's shock the world and make Skechers cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she's gonna do it. <laughs> I trust. Like I've seen the shoes. They're cool. Yeah. So I mean, it it just has to make sense. Obviously, the deal has to make sense. The money has to make sense, and all that kind of stuff. But like, you know, it 
partnerships do not work unless the artist is bought in. You know, like I said, it, and it's not just Doge. It's, I've seen it with a bunch of artists. If they're not bought in and they're not leaning in and really promoting it because they believe in it, it's just not going to work. It's going to just look like a forced situation. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And you've said also in that same topic of building out these full music careers that unless you have a full music career, most existing platforms are not of existing are not of enough value to artists, and so you created avenues to help leverage independent artists' communities to maximize value. And wanted to ask you a little bit more about how you think independent artists can leverage their communities more. Yeah, I mean, I I guess the easiest way is is with what we're doing with Songfinch, right? And it's so it's uh, it's allowing the artist. To, you know, we, we hand them opportunities, right? We're doing the marketing. We're getting customers in. Um, customers can select an artist or they can have us select for them. But we're giving the artist now a platform to promote themselves on Songfinch as well. Like, why should you pick me? Let me do this for you or whatever. And, like, we've created real fans. You get a personal song from somebody about your life, like, you're going to like that artist, right? You're going to want to know more about that artist. And so we've connected them. And they're able to build a community through that. Like, these are... You know, these are uh, there's like tiers of fans, right? Fans that may buy a ticket, they may buy your album, they may go to your concert. Like these are fans that are going to do all of that, and we've seen it. And they, you know, they tip more for the songs, and so we've given a platform for these independent artists to just build their fan base, build their community, and also work with other artists that are similar to them. We have all sorts of different initiatives that we're about to launch with Songfinch that is going to promote just that it's going to promote these artists on a bigger platform and a bigger light and allow them to do more for their own career than rather than rely on us spending millions in marketing to bring to bring customers in yeah and for artists that are also even outside of song finch how can they start to do some of the things that you mentioned with getting brand deals and positioning themselves properly and Obviously, you can't get the sketchers right off yeah. the bat, but how do you start to build, even if it's a portfolio towards that? Yeah, I mean, brands brands are going to come based on numbers. Like, they, that's what they care about, right? Engagement and numbers. So even if you don't have a huge following on Instagram or whatever, if you can show that, like, you, out of your 100,000 fans, 50,000 of them respond, that's great. And that's that's how it was for Doja for a long time. It was like she didn't have crazy numbers, but she had crazy engagement. She would post something, she would have five million followers, and there'd be two million likes. Like that doesn't happen, you know. So the way to do that is to really engage with your fans, right? Like go on live, talk to them as much as you can. I, you know, I, I, there isn't one sort of route for that, um, but that's what brands look for. They look for that engagement. They look for numbers. Some brands are smarter than others. Um, and it's like, uh, again, like as an artist, if you align yourself, if you use a product or something like that, like then reach out, like yeah. comment on their page, do what, you know, it's, uh, again, common sense stuff. Yeah. But like, yeah, you're not going to get Nike knocking at your door if you have 300 followers, you know, you have to be realistic about it. Um, and I think you have to build up your fan base first rather than trying to align with a brand because it's just it's really hard as an independent artist to just go out and get a big check from some big brand yeah that makes sense and i was listening to and this part is really interesting to me i was listening to something you said on a different podcast where you said you're not the creative and you're more focused on the business yeah and i was curious what you think helps you in having conversations with artists on the business side since you don't speak that creative side um well, I think I think me being a lawyer has helped. And they just like a lot of artists are like, "Oh, shit, you're you're a lawyer. Like, you must be smart." That's not the case. Like, I feel like I'm okay, but like there are a lot of lawyers who are not smart. Just period. That's why you retired. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons. So, um I I have experience. Like I've built businesses, you know, and like I understand how to turn a product into a business and like I will write a deck. I will do a business plan. I will show what a org chart looks like for an artist. And they have to look at it. I, I am constantly preaching. Like, you have to look at this as a business. Like, you create art, and then we make money from that art. And here's how we do it, right? And so 
I, that that's my job. You know, I mean, like, that's what I do. I'm not going to, I have opinions about music. I think I've got a decent ear and like, I, I think I'm at a, I'm at a point now where Doja will, she'll listen to my opinion. She asked for it. Yeah. She actually had like, <laughs> it's crazy, but last week she did. So it, it, it took a while, but, um, only 11 years. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I think it's like, I don't have that credibility like that's why gordon and i work so well he's an a and r guy like he's he's been living music his whole life like i've been around music i've appreciated music and but it just hasn't been what well, i can't make music you know like I, a little bit but not <laughs> not that i want to talk about <laughs> anyway so i i think that's that's my job you know like that's what i have to do and and that's what i've been able to do pretty well is like build these businesses whether it's for m- myself my partners or it's for artists yeah, that's really interesting. Um, what and you've also said that a lot of artists hate social media. Like back to going back to that conversation and talking to them yeah. about the things you need to do for your business. Yeah, you're thinking about it um, because it's a part of their job. Yeah, and funny enough, some of the artists that we've had on the show have expressed a similar or the same thing. And I'm curious what you think causes that for them to hate it. Yeah, I think it's shifted. I think that. Um, for a while, you know, social media was, that was it, right? Like you had to be on socials. You have to do this. You have to be on all platforms. It's all about your outreach and your engagement. It still is to a certain degree, but it's become toxic. Like Twitter is the worst place in the world. X. X, my bad. <laughs> At whatever it's called. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Elon, Elon's calling it today. But like, you know, and and, and I don't think Threads is going to be much better, right? Like it is, it is it's awful. And like, I will watch artists go down this black hole of just horrible people that don't know anything that are anonymous on there. And like, I don't know how anybody could like it. You know, I don't, I don't know how anybody could enjoy doing that and putting themselves out there only to get just ripped apart by people that don't know them. So I understand why artists hate it, you know, but like there are, there are, positives there are ways that it's never been easier to get your music out and like your videos out you can you know be a creator on any platform i think for me it's like what works best for the artist right for um there's a song finch artist that we're working with she's great on tiktok she's just great on that her instagram's kind of whatever she doesn't know what to do on twitter but like tiktok's great they just focus on on that platform um you know so i I think that it's 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 sort of Depends on the artist. I don't know if that's the answer. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. For you, what are some ways that managers and artists can work together to collaborate more in the marketing, fan engagement strategy side of things? And what does that successful kind of system look like for you, the artist that you work with, um, that makes it least frustrating on both sides? Yeah. <laughs> least frustrating. That That is the goal. Um <laughs> I think it's, again, understanding, you have to understand who the artist is. You know, you can't force a partnership that doesn't make sense. You can't force, uh, oh, everybody's got a tequila, so we better create a tequila. You know, like that That happens all the time, you know. And I was I was managing an artist for a little bit, and, like, I literally had that conversation where he's like, well, I got to have a, I gotta have a tequila. <laughs> like, why do you have to have a tequila? He's like, well, these guys have one. Yeah. And it's like, no, that's not going to work, you know. <laughs> so finding out what... The artist is passionate like, about. Do you even drink? Right. <laughs> like, like, yeah, he did. But uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's like figuring out what the artist is passionate about. I think, like for for Doja, she just wants to make art. She wants to be creative. And so for us, it's constantly being like, well, what about this idea? You know, like you put her name on anything, it's going to move, right? Like it might not move like crazy, but like people are going to pay attention to it. So you have to be really careful. Like I don't want to put her name on something that is crap like we in, especially as she was starting to explode we got offers from everybody and like we said no to 99 percent of them because it was just like Man, i don't know who this company is i've never heard of this they have a bad reputation whatever it is so you have to be really careful with that but then you get to a point where it's like well let's create your own stuff you want to create your own shoe that's going to be tough to do but let's partner with sketchers where you can do that yourself you know she wants to do stuff she loves animals maybe we look at doing something with cats you know yeah. like there's some on brand yeah on brand on the nose but like that'll work you know those kind of things will work. <laughs> yeah no no more cows but uh 
but yeah, it, it really depends. Cause like I said, if the artist doesn't lean into it, it's just not going to work. You know, like if, if I have to tell her, Hey, you have to post, you know, or like I said before from that story, like it's just, it's painful. Mm-hmm. It's, it, she doesn't want to do it. And most artists are like that. But if it's like, man, I love this stuff. I want to, to be involved. I mean, look at, he's not a musician, but look at the rock. Like, for a year, he didn't have a post that didn't have his tequila next to him. You know, whether he was pitching it or not. Like, yeah. the man knows what he's doing. He knows how to market stuff. That's what you need. You need, like, a full buy-in to whatever it is, or it's just going to look corny. Yeah. Cheesy. Yeah. Know? That makes sense. Um, and so, we've talked a little bit about Doja so far. Yeah. Now we can talk a little bit more. Okay. About <laughs> Doja. <laughs> so, everyone knows your Doja Cat's manager. Yeah. What does a day in the life of Doja Cat's manager look like Mm -hmm. and managing someone so high profile. Yeah. I know people have expectations of what they think that is, but what is something that people might not expect it entails? Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think every artist is unique. I so you know, I've sort of floated around on the outskirts of the, the Gaga camp and I saw her go from a very high profile manager to somebody probably people don't know who her manager is, you know? And like, that's what I wanted. I, 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 I didn't want... Not all this fan fear. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. No, but I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it depends. Like I said, it depends on the artist. For, for Doja, um, every day is different. You know, we have... Uh, we spent a year and a half where she really didn't do much. You know, she, did, she wasn't making music. She wasn't touring. We had to cancel a tour. Um, we kept her very active through fashion. Like that's something she's passionate about, right? And it got so much press, and it it was great, and it allowed us to get more, par- you know, partnerships in, and it allowed her to express herself without having to put music out. So it was great, and it was a, a very good sort of holdover um, into this new era of, uh, that we're about to roll out. So for like a day in the life now, it it depends. It depends if I have constant calls, constant meetings with the label with. Um, she is a huge visual artist. So every video is crazy. It's crazier than the next one. So there's a lot of moving parts with that. Um, I couldn't do any of it without Gordon, without my partner. He's in LA. He is having to do a lot of stuff that I don't want to do. He's a great schmoozer. Like he would love to be on your podcast. Uh, (laughs) Uh, but like, you know, it's dealing with, people it's managing different people it's um delegating it's it's running a business so you run a business you know every day is different it's it's not as much if you're good at it it's not as much about putting out fires as it is like planning right and like okay well this is what we got to do for this day and this is what we got to do for that day i've sort of designed this team like that we have our team is small and really effective and for me i do have other artists that i work with but she is my focus. Like I don't, she is a brand. She is generating a ton of money and can generate a ton more. And so like, why go distract yourself and try to be scooter? Like I, you know, I no shade on scooter. He's amazing. He's a billionaire or whatever. Like yeah. that's great. That's not me. I don't want to. Yeah. I, no, I don't. <laughs> I, it's never going to happen. Like I just don't have it in me. Like I want to focus more on song Finch and growing that into something that's worth billions. Right. And with Doja, like, that's the same thing. Like, this is a one in a billion opportunity. She can be Rihanna. She can be Beyonce. She can be Gaga. And those artists are, they're icons. And they have very long careers. And they generate millions and millions and millions of dollars. And she hasn't even gone on tour yet. You know, so it's like, why start distracting yourself with other artists and other headaches yeah one headache's good (laughs) so i think it's it and and that only comes from maturity and being in this for a long time because i did for a long time i was like oh i'm gonna manage everybody you know and and no i don't want that yeah you know like i said everybody as a manager you want this opportunity why distract yourself you know yeah take your eye off the ball yeah yeah and you said something now that's actually that's really interesting that i want to dive a little bit deeper into so it's interesting that you've curated this super small type team, even at the scale that she's at. Mm-hmm. When you're smaller, what are those most important pieces in that smaller level of team that you yeah. need starting out? Uh, I mean, you have to have abs. Oh. If you're watching this, you have an audience interacting with you, coming to your events, buying stuff from you, and tons more. 
Revit plugs into all that and tells you who your top fans are so that you can target them in a more personalized way. For me, the, the team that we have, like, there are certain positions that you have to fill, but, like, the number one thing about everybody that uh, is on our team is, is trust. Like, if I hand something off to our project managers, I know it's going to get done. You know, like, I don't have to constantly hound them. I don't have to worry about it. We have people in different spots around her that make her life easy, right? So she has an assistant that took us a long time to find. Her last assistant was too good, was doing too much, and it, the, the lines got blurred, right? So we promoted her to project manager, right? I have somebody here in Chicago, Whitney, who's been working with me forever. She's the most organized person I know. So calendars, um, alerts, letting her know we got to post this, handling social posts, all that kind of stuff. I've, I trust Whitney with my kids, you know, that that's the kind of relationship we have. And then Gordon, as my co-manager in LA, like he moves with her. I've got two kids. Like I'm not going to go on every trip. I can't do it. He loves that. <laughs> you know, he's really good at <laughs> yeah. it. So like it, it's particular for each artist, but for us, like that's really it. We've got a brand partnership guy that I was talking about. He's great. He handles all of that. We have our legal team now that I'm out of it. They're great. They, you know, I trust them completely. Um, and then it's like outside people. Like we have our project manager on the label side that we're in constant communication with. That's not an employee. You know, we have our booking agent. Again, not an employee, but like in charge of the tour. So it's just um, people have to be, you have to be available pretty much all the time <laughs> um, within reason. And yeah, I just have to, you just, I got to trust everybody that I work with. Yeah. And that's the same thing. Like you have to really do it as an artist. Like you better trust the people that are handling your career because it can go south. Yeah. And about three years ago in an interview, you said right now I manage, quotes, right now I manage Doja Cat. If you haven't heard of her already, you will soon. Mm. How did you know that then? Three years. I'm trying to think what was happening three years ago. I mean, she's, you know, she, I knew she was like special and everybody says like, Oh, I, I knew that one was yeah. going to hit, but like she was just, I just liked her music. You know, like when she came out with, um, how high was like the first song that she put out, that song was great. And I was just like, man, this is dope. And then when she did the Amala album is when I sort of got back involved and I heard all the music and I loved it. I was just like, man, this music's really good. And I knew that if people heard it, like, and the labels did what they were supposed to do, like, this could be a big artist, right? And then I started getting to know her better and see what she was doing online and how her fans were so engaged. And that was it. And then like the Moo thing, like I remember her calling me and being like, I think this is going to go viral. And I was like, what did you do? You know? And then I saw, I was like, ah, uh, okay. And, and she was right. She, she is not always right, but she is usually right about stuff with music and creative. Like she's just got a different brain for that kind of stuff. And I've never worked with anybody like that where they just they, – they're going to follow their path and, like, people are going to follow along, you yeah. know? And she, she said something the other day that was really kind of prolific. Like, we're in a position now to sort of teach people what they should like. And she's, she's not wrong. Like, you know, that's what these top artists can do. Like, she's introducing a whole new look, a whole new era. Taylor Swift is doing the same thing. It's like – they dictate what we as a mass like, and it better be good, right? <laughs> you yeah. know, or I don't want to be a part of it. And she's just, she's really good, you know? So it wasn't, it's, it wasn't like a, a big leap, yeah. you know, to be like, this artist is going to be big. Things aligned. The partnership with the label has been good. They understand that she's a visual artist and that like her videos are, I mean, I don't know if it's the main reason, but it was one of the biggest reasons why she took off. Um, her creative director is pretty brilliant too. He's a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> Love you, Brett. But like, uh, but he's brilliant. And the two of them together, it's like it's unstoppable. So yeah, it wasn't a big, it wasn't a, a difficult bet. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's just interesting to see how you thought about it, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I just you know, I heard the music. I hear the music before other people do, and I'm like, oh man, this. Yeah. I, it, wait till y'all. Yeah, this. right. <laughs> like, can't wait for this new album to come out. Excited. You're, so you're as knowledgeable about the intersection of entertainment, music, and tech as anyone. And I'm curious what strategies you 
Gordon Doja implemented early to build these authentic connections. You talked about her having good engagement starting out, but what did you guys do to facilitate this process? Any technology that helped? And what tools or platforms have been game changers for you guys? I think IG Live has been the biggest tool for her. Um, she'll say that she hates it, but like... Oh, she does. <laughs> but she goes... <laughs> She, you know, ever since she was just kind of unknown, she would go on there and just mess around, like play music and create music. And people like seeing that, you know, and they like seeing her. She's, you know, she's pretty. People like, like, it's true. You know, I mean, it's like people like seeing her and seeing her be herself and use IG Live to like just show her life. It, it worked, you know, it was especially key during the pandemic when people couldn't leave, you know? And so she was, she was great at that. Her engagement on Twitter is something that I, I don't like, but like she trolls people really well. She's really good at it. You know, she's really good at just like being funny. She is a really funny person. And so she uses it. Like she says some crazy shit on there, but like people like it. They yeah. like, you know, she, she knows how to read, an audience online. She grew up on the internet. She just knows how to work the internet. Um, and so for us, like we just go, like just do it. You know, I mean, there are times where I say, please stop. <laughs> um, and I think it's gotten to the point now where she's so famous that it's become, it's kind of flipped on her a little bit. It's become a little toxic for her. Um, and she's seen some dark sides of it. And so now it's like a counter, but we got to counterbalance that a little bit, like find your happy place on the internet rather than just, you know, treat it the way you used to treat it. So for for us, you know, like I said, that the YouTube has been huge. The the partnership that we have with YouTube, the um, the videos that we're able to create um, have elevated her. You know, where everybody wants to find every video she puts out trends immediately. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's. I mean, she is an internet artist yeah. for sure. Everybody's like, oh, she broke on TikTok. Like, no, she didn't. Yeah, uh, her songs did. She didn't come up with any of that stuff. So like she, the only trend she ever actually did on TikTok was the streets, the silhouette challenge. She waited until that was almost done. Cardi B did it. And then she's like, all right, I guess yeah. I should do it now. And it was like, you know, it was kind of funny that she did it yeah. way back then. So, um, so yeah, I mean, she doesn't like TikTok. She doesn't like, <laughs> again, like if she's being forced to do something, it's not going to work. Yeah. And what is the, the partnership with YouTube allow you to do that you couldn't do before? I mean, we just get, we just get preferential treatment. You know, they just they they put marketing money behind it. They um, they will help promote her. They will do billboards. They will put her at the top of the you know YouTube Shorts pages. All of those things um, because she brings them millions and millions of views <laughs> and millions and millions of dollars. So um, they've just been a, a pretty good friend. They've you know it's Google, so they've had her do um, a commercial for Pixel. You know during the Super Bowl. So like. They've been a great partner. And I'm curious also with what you talked about and how she engages on different platforms. I'm sure everyone is curious about this. Is it all always her? Yeah. I mean, we'll post for her. Like she'll approve an image that needs to be posted and like we will post it. Like she doesn't physically post everything. But yeah, no, I've never told her you need to go on live and do this. Cause it, it, yeah. won't, it won't go well for yeah. me if I do that. So yeah, it is her. I mean, is, are you asking, is, is that a character or is that really her? No, no, no. no, no. Uh, yeah. They're like the tweets even like, is this her? Like, Oh yeah. No, no. I've never tweeted for her. <laughs> I don't know if that, yeah, I don't No, Nobody's ever tweeted for her ever. Wow. Yeah. That's her. <laughs> I, well, the reasons for them, yeah. you know, like we've talked about yeah. it and stuff, but you know, no, that that's her. That's really cool. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, because you know, when you get to a certain scale, it's like you still want the brand to f look and feel like you. Yeah, but there's just so much. That Her brand is kind of I just don't give a fuck. Like, I mean, honestly, it just it 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 just is. Like, she just is her, and she's un unapologetic. And like, I think that's what a lot of her fans identify with. It's like there's going to be some good, there's going to be some bad, it's going to be messy, but like this, it's just her. Yeah. I'm curious, what's your take on the rise of this closer fan artist relationship? So there's TikTok you've mentioned, Threads, Twitter. A lot of things are removing that gap that used to exist between mm -hmm. an artist and a fan more and more. And 
I'm curious what you see the future of that is is going to be. I don't know. I mean, I think um, I don't know. I think uh, it's a timely question, right? With yeah. especially if you just Google what's going on with Doja right now. Um, I think that there's this uh, this stan culture that has has developed that I think is it can be effective and fans are important and we need fans to fill arenas and um, generate revenue for artists and without fans it's like what's the point um, but there is an element just like any anything like there is an element that takes it too far right where it's like you feel like you know the artist you feel like you know everything about them because of what you've seen online and it's just not true it's just it's just never true and fans will get so attached to this idea that they know everything there is to know about an artist that it it, it gets weird <clears throat> you know they're they're telling her they're telling us what to do and so we you know do do your own thing like live your own life enjoy the music thank you for participating but like it's none of your business you know so it's 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 tough it's tough to ignore um you don't want to alienate your fans your real fans um but it's it's weird like these fan pages for you know ariana grande and Nicki minaj and beyonce they, they're they're armies right it's like what what are you talking about your armies you're you're on a social media platform but i understand what they're talking about to a certain extent because like if we need a song to go number one you need to have the armies get behind you and so like they are effective it's just this line gets blurred, right? Because it's like you're living everything on your phone. And it's like you you feel like empowered because you're a, a stan of some artist. It, it's just weird. I don't know. Like I don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. Um, Support versus control. Yeah, at, exactly. And it's like we love fans. We need fans. We don't need life coaches, you know? We don't need people like – assuming that they know better because they're a fan like i don't i don't tell a doctor what to do because i watched a doctor's show like I, it, you know it doesn't make sense but it, they get wrapped up in it and it's like this has been happening for forever you know it's just now it's way more accessible and you can feel like you are really close you have a very close connection to someone because yeah it's you can text someone they might message you back you know doja does that yeah not always in a positive way, but like, yeah, it just sort of depends. Like you can take the Beyonce model and just never say a word, you know, or, you know, there's like Gaga was more active on socials. Now she uses socials for like her activism and stuff like that. Like there's just a choice that you have to make as an artist. How involved do you want to be? Yeah, I really like that. Um, and as a follow up to that, what's your message to emergent artists that don't have a huge team supporting them what should they be doing around fan engagement and marketing and i'm curious what you've seen as kind of basic ways that artists don't promote themselves well enough or things that they might just be leaving on the table mm -hmm. um because they feel like they need a massive budget yeah i i i will tell you this just like i don't really listen to the beats that people send me people that hit me and say i need a manager you don't need a manager. Like if you're asking someone on Instagram to be their, your manager, like you're not in a position where you need one. Um, you need a manager when you have a, a, an actual career that generates revenue. And I don't mean to sound like an asshole, but it's just the way it is. Like managers can help you, um, but you need to help yourself. Like you need, this is your job. This is your career. You've got to figure this shit out yourself first, you know, get advice where you can ask for help, I have no problem helping an artist being like who's asking questions like, Hey, how do you do this? Or what do you think about that? Like, that's fine. But just being like, I got to get a manager. I'm never going to win. Like I, that doesn't, that's just not true. You know? So, um, managers will seek out talent rather than take incoming, you know, requests. So I think it's like you figure out what works best for you, figure out what platform works best for you. Be constantly, you know, pitching your work you treat yourself as a brand how do you promote your brand i don't know it depends on each artist um but don't depend on others and don't think you need a team to be successful because a team will elevate your success but you need to you need to create that success yourself 
There's a really good question that someone submitted that will ask us on this uh, when we get to that portion. So now we're going into quick fire. Okay. We have like five rapid fire questions, and then we'll go into questions that were submitted by the lovely Fanarchy supporters. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> so what's one of your favorite aspects of the whole artist management process? And then what is the most difficult or frustrating part of being an artist manager? Um, I mean, seeing, seeing a project that you're working on for months or years even come to life is pretty gratifying, you know, seeing all the hard work that the artist puts into it and that <clears throat> the team puts into it and then people enjoying it and having it go nuts, going into a, you know, a stadium in Brazil and seeing a hundred thousand people singing the song. It's really cool. Like, I mean, it's just really cool and satisfying. The award stuff is whatever, you know, I mean, they're cool, I guess. Um, but it's kind of like, all right, with the, a big shelf. Yeah, <laughs> it's like whatever. It's just it's there's a lot of politics and stuff that it's just kind of annoying. But like seeing these creative ideas as like just a brainchild come to life in a in a massive way is awesome. I did something with the cool kids where we did this night school thing where they they're multi talented guys, right? Like they can act. Chuck is a crazy uh, cook. Um, Tuan had. He's got. Uh, he had a, a podcast that, or a, a Twitch stream that did really well, and we were able to like create this thing called Night School, where it was every element of it as one event, and it was awesome. And we're gonna keep doing it, but like seeing that come to life was so cool. As like, hey, you guys do all these different things, and now let's bring it all together and make it make it real. the The most frustrating part is like an idea like that, like Night School, getting money for the next one. Because like I, I'm not going to keep paying for, for the production of it. And so it's like finding sponsors, finding people that will support you to bring your art to life. Like that that's the most frustrating part. Because you know you have something really good and you just need more people. That's what every independent artist feels, you know. How do I get enough people to see this so I can make money? Yeah. And how do you feel like your experiences at Song Finch and Lawyers for Musicians have shaped your approach as a manager? Mm. I still, I, I think I still sort of feel like I'm a little guy fighting against the, you know, the big bad industry or whatever. I think having a little chip on your shoulder in that way is is good. Um, I think I definitely did, like I said, as a, as a lawyer, you know, where you get calls from lawyers like, "Oh, what coast are you on?" It's like Lake Michigan, you yeah. know, like what do you mean? What coast am I on? Doesn't mean I don't know music law. That's that's one of my next questions. Yeah, <laughs> literally about that, but we'll get. To yeah, that. I think I think. Um, yeah, that that like there are there is plenty of money in music to be made and it shouldn't be controlled by just one percent, you know, or five percent. It should be spread amongst the masses and, and with Song Finch it's like showing the power of an individual song and getting an artist paid for that. And, you know, it's two hundred bucks doesn't sound like it's that much money, but when you're selling a thousand songs a year, it it adds up. Yeah. It's a career. So um yeah. That's my answer. Yeah, it's helpful. <laughs> you already answered one of these, but you've talked a lot about a ton of music talent in Chicago, but there's not a ton of infrastructure or resources to support it. So people feel like they have to move to New yeah. York, they have to move to LA. There's people talking to you about what coast they're yeah, yeah. Why do people have this uh, belief that that's the way it has to be? I think, um, I think it's shifted. I think the pandemic shifted everything, right? Like I know a lot of, managers that don't live in LA or New York you know I think everybody left New York for LA because it was just too expensive to live in New York and now LA everybody's moving out of LA moving to Austin and Nashville and all over the place I think that you know as technology continues to grow it's going to be less and less important where you are um you know I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere like that's my goal like where nobody knows where I am and I still want to work, you yeah. know, and, and that's possible now. I think that Chicago, for a long time, it was like this fly fly through city. Like you needed this market and it's cool, but all the studios, all the producers, all the writers, the labels, the publishers are not here. Um, there's not a lot of management companies here either. I don't, I don't know why that's happened. We've had like a couple of years ago, there was like a committee of management in Chicago that was trying to get together and like work together. It didn't work. Like it just didn't, it didn't really happen. I don't, I don't know if there's like a feeling that you can't collaborate as well here. I hope that's not the case, but um, I don't know the solution to it. I've, you know, I've thought about, it, I've tried to work on it. 
with other managers here and it just doesn't seem to click. I think there's a, um, I don't know what it is. I don't, I, I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that, but like, it still is that way where artists feel like this is not, there's not enough here. And I, I just, I disagree with it. I think you can have your career wherever you want it to be. Yeah. And what do you think, what are your hopes actually for the future of music creators, this, uh, this industry and whether that's related to artist management, the intersection of music and tech, or anything, what are your plans to continue to make an impact in the space? I mean, I think, again, it's like, you know, with Doja, it's a different story, right? Like, she's on this crazy trajectory, and we're just getting bigger and bigger, and this tour is going to be crazy and all that. Songfinch is what will have the biggest impact for artists, I think. I think as we continue to grow and develop, and you know, everybody's freaked out about AI and replacement. And I, I am a little bit, um, but lawyers will get in the way. And I've <laughs> said this from the beginning and it's happening. Like you're not going to be able to monetize Drake's voice. Like you just can't do that, you know, and there's too much money involved for labels and publishers not to get involved and for artists not to get involved to stop it. But to, to use AI to help artists, is something that we're focused on on Songfinch. Like we are, we are, we already have tools that are going to do it, and that is awesome. And it's just going to be able to allow artists to create something. And we're kind of like bringing back this idea of a mechanical royalty, where you're going to create one song, and that song is going to be there's going to be several iterations of it, but every time it sells, you're going to make money. And like that's what it used to be, right? Yeah. When people bought records. So I'm excited about the future, and I feel like with Songfinch, especially, like we are positioned where. We're not trying to replace artists. Um, John, my co-founder, always talks about the Iron Man suit, right? Like where we've got Tony Stark, and now we're just giving all the tools of the suit to to Tony. Yeah. And I, I, I truly think we can do that and have a, a huge impact on, yeah. on artists. That's what makes me really excited to like have you on the podcast. Also, like have Song Finch as, as friends and... Um, especially with what we're doing as well to use AI to help artists. Absolutely. I think that that's what the future is going to yeah, be. Yeah, we're on the same and, team. Uh, yeah, it's exciting to be on the same team. So we have some questions from people. You don't think people are sick of, of me? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> the ones who stuck around. <laughs> so this one's from Aiden. I hope I'm saying that correctly. He says, I'd like to know at what point did you take Doja on as a client and should up-and-coming artists look for booking agents? Um, so it was about 10, 11 years ago, 10 and a half years ago or something like that. I got asked to, um, represent her as a, as a lawyer, this guy, Yeti, um, who discovered her, um, I became friends with him. Uh, he was trying to sign her, so I couldn't be his lawyer. Right. And she needed a lawyer. She was actually underage. She was 17. So I was her mom's lawyer. Um, and that's when I met her and stayed in touch with her for, uh, a couple years after that, and then kind of fell out of touch with her when she signed to Kimasabi, um, and then got brought back in 2016, somewhere around there, 2015, 16, um, when her first album was coming out. Um, so that's how I met her, um, and you know, yeah, been in her life ever since. Um, the booking agent, booking agents aren't gonna care unless you are already booking. It's a tough situation to be in. Um, unless <clears throat> you've got a track record and a ticket history, it's really hard to get a, a, a really good booking agent. There are smaller, <clears throat> more regional booking agents that can be helpful. You know, if you can show like, Hey, I did, you know, I played Shubas and sold it out. Like, okay, well, you know, can you sell out Metro? Like you, you just gotta do it. Your, again, you gotta do a lot of it yourself. But once you get that ticket history in a city or in a region, yeah, bo- a booking agent, you need one. You know, they, they'll find opportunities for you. That's awesome. Um, and on the topic of uh, doing a lot of stuff yourself, uh, this question is from Yavin. It says, how do you typically go about structuring your schedule as a manager? I'm still self-managed artist, so structure has been one of the most important parts of keeping myself afloat. But sometimes maintaining that structure isn't easy. Any tips for planning out a day or a week? Um, I have a crazy calendar system. Right. Because I have two kids. Um, I have, uh, well, now I have like just three jobs instead of like six, but, um, two of them is done. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. Uh, and I, I, I think, um, I have somebody in Whitney who helps me just stay organized. She's not my assistant, but like she is my right hand person 
in terms of reminders and like, you know, figuring out schedules. The Doja schedule alone is, it, it's crazy. You know, it's, there's nonstop calls. I've gotten 75 texts since we've been sitting yeah. here about, about stuff we have to do today. Um, I think one, one thing that's funny is that like I sit with my wife every Sunday and we have cocktails and calendars and we plan out, like we have to plan out your personal life or you're going to, your personal relationships are going to suffer. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm in Chicago. Most of the Doja camp is in LA. So I get a two hour head start on them. Usually it also means that I'm, you know, still working or still getting text messages late at night, but like you just kind of have to be available, but technology makes it a lot easier to do it. I, I would like to be more organized, but I think, um, yeah, just having people around you that can help. And if you're doing it all by yourself, it's just like, man, just rely on your calendar system and have some time to yourself too. It's important. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, someone says, how should artists spend money in the earlier stages? Recording, promotion, touring, where is the best place to spend that money? Um, promotion's tough. It's like if you get a good PR agent, it can be helpful. But like how good is an article on Pitchfork for your career? Like I, I don't know. There's no – there's – the only I, – I guess for an artist, like, yeah, make sure your music's fucking awesome. Like, just make sure your music is as good as it can possibly be. Um, and then self-promotion is the cheapest way to do it, using socials to your advantage. And, yeah, performing, like getting out and and making real connections with people and fans. Um and talking to them afterwards and hanging out with fans afterwards, that's how buzz starts. Um, it's either on socials or it's in person in my experience. That's helpful. And then someone says, what's the number one marketing mistake artists make early on? Uh, marketing mistake. Uh, I would say dumping everything into one, either one song or one video or one idea. Like, um, also, just going to somebody because someone told you to go to them is usually not a good idea, and that's what I'm saying right now. So I think it's like uh, if you're going to spend money on PR, understand what they are going to do. You know, if their whole goal is to just get blog write-ups, like, I don't know, is that going to work? Probably not. You know, um, you used to be able to spend money and, and get on playlists. You know, that can be effective, it's illegal, but it can be it can be effective. So it's it's just knowing what you're going to get for your money. Get a real like set of deliverables from whomever you're spending that money with. I think, and, and not just like I'm going to throw five thousand dollars at this video and hope it works. Yeah. Because if you spend five thousand dollars on a video and you don't have any money to promote it, yeah, nobody's going to see it. Yeah. And this this one's from Cushy. She says. Can you share the experience of getting Doja signed to RCA Records and how you and the team decided which label to go with and how the music slash label industry has evolved since then? No. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, truthfully, when she signed, she signed Akima Sabi, which is Dr. Luke's label, um, I did not do that deal with her. Then Akima Sabi partnered with RCA. So RCA just took over that contract. So there was no negotiation there. Um since she's been with RCA, she's been every album has come out with RCA. Um, they've been good. They've been a, a really good partner, but that's because she's a massive artist. You know, at the very beginning, we didn't get a lot of attention. You know, it was like, oh, wow, you need fifty grand for a video. That's gonna be tough. Okay. Now it's like, how many videos do you want to do? Yeah. Um, it's just you know, it's 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 success. They have been, they've been understanding. They've been appreciative they've been a good partner. I mean, they really have been. Um, that's not the case with everybody. And it, again, it just depends on the artist. If you are an unknown artist and you signed a deal because you needed to go to a label and nobody's paying attention to you or they don't like your project, you're not going to like that label because yeah. they're not going to do shit. Yeah. Um, but when you're at this level and you want to continue to grow, you're making them a fortune. Yeah, they're going to help you because you're making them a shit ton of money. It's, it's not, not super complicated. And I think as far as the label systems go, it's, it is very much needed when you're at this level. To get to this level, I don't see how you do it without a label. I just don't because they are a bank for you and they are a radio promotion team. They are a 
um, video promotion team. They are they have people in every category that that you need. Um, but primarily, they're just a huge they're they're a bank. I mean, you need that. You could do it yourself, um, but it gets really expensive, you know. So um, it would be really hard. Yeah. And our last question is from Landon. It says, which insights hold the highest importance when gathering data about a musician's community? Which insights? I think engagement. I think it's like, you know, um, I don't know if this is the right, if this is what he's looking for. But like, like I said, you can have a million followers, but if you're only getting 300 likes, something's off. Either you paid for those followers or, I, I you know, which people do. So I think if it, the engagement level to me is the most important. Like if you post something and out of your million, only a few people are responding or commenting, like you're not having an impact. So it doesn't really matter how many followers you have. Um, I, I think that's it. I think like a, an example with Mikey from the Cool Kids, he had this mystery school Twitch stream that I was talking about. They didn't have crazy numbers of, of viewers, but man, those viewers were rabid for content and they sold out of merch every time they put it on like you don't need a massive community you just need really good fans and people that are as engaged as possible hear that guys fan engagement ai we're talking about the real stuff today any last things you want to add no you should work with rivet oh that's that's all we need (laughs) (laughs) i'm joking um it's really great to have you on the show today um, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for and having me. And excited for all the projects you have coming soon. Thank you. Peace. If you're watching this, you have an audience interacting with you, coming to your events, buying stuff from you, and tons more. Rivet plugs into all that and tells you who your top fans are so that you can target them in a more personalized way. With Rivet, you can put your fan engagement on autopilot, deepen your fan relationships, and take your sales all the way up. Join our exclusive beta today at rivet.app and take your community and creative business to the next level for free.